this morning, Coach Lewis, um, a very special person in in my life. But just you know, if you look at women's basketball, you look at basketball. Period. Um, you've got such an amazing background from your time as a player to your time as a coach and mentoring people like me. I'm so excited to have you on the vault today um, to to share more of your your story. And again, I have uh, pulled up on my screen, which I'll I'll share. Anybody can can look you up um, online because you have such a great background. These words don't really encapsulate who you are and and what your experience is. Um, and I'm really excited to to have the opportunity to to vault with you today, um, because obviously you were my coach uh, at Fordham, um, and you're actually you're a lot of the inspiration for for the work I'm doing now, which is taking a moment to really appreciate the people and the history and the stories. Um, that are the foundation that makes us who we are. And you are a big piece of my foundation. I would not be who I am without you. Well, and it's always great to be with you, Laura. You are truly one of the most special people that I've met in my 76 years <laughs> on earth. And uh, you know, you're like a daughter to Karen and I, and uh, so proud of you for all that you have done and will continue to do, because that's you and you are a creative genius. And I mean that sincerely, oh. you, you know, when you, when you see, I always tell people that basketball players uh, are gifted in so many ways, certainly the, the skill sets that they bring to the court, but the creativity and the, and the intellect uh, sometimes is not fully appreciated because oh. our game is boom, boom, boom. You know, you don't call it uh, a play and then go back to the huddle, you know, nothing wrong with football, but, Mm -hmm. uh, we're so spontaneous in our interactions on the floor yep. and your, uh, your training, you know, prepared you, uh, for this and so many other things, uh, you know, your playing career and, and your love of people and your abilities to relate, uh, and communicate well, uh, I guess Fordham had you in a special project for slow learners. No, they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I'm so proud of you. So, okay, well, here we go. Um, well, I mentioned 76 years of age and uh, played golf the last two days, so I have a new love. Uh, that sport is beautiful. But I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I'm actually a fifth generation Alexandrian and uh, great parents. Alexandria was a highly segregated uh, part of this country. Uh, five miles from Washington, D.C., and I'm the youngest of five children, four older sisters, so I, I think I was not only socialized, but I was predestined to coach women, <laughs> and, and it's been great because my oldest sister was a great basketball player and taught me how to play, So, but uh, there were certain uh, geographic uh, pockets of Alexandria where uh, the Black community lived. Um, and we lived in an area uh, still known as Seminary. It's Alexandria, but it was highlighted, and it is to this day, uh, by the Virginia Theological Seminary, of which my grandfather uh, was one of many um, African Americans who helped build and work at this great institution. My father was literally born on the campus, and so they are now involved with the reparations program uh, where they're honoring the uh, ancestors who helped build and work yep. uh, and create uh, this over 200 year institution. So uh, as descendants, my sisters and I and other families in seminary, because again, you could just walk, those of us who lived, you know, families uh, who lived in seminary could just walk to their place of employment and, and, uh, and have a great life. So so we're grateful to them that they're honoring our parents. Uh, my grandfather worked there for 27 years uh, mm. and we used to play there and, you know, ice skate and stuff. So it was a very welcoming environment. Uh, they had a uh, uh, tremendous formal event where about 200 of us were there. So um, it's, it's reparations. Sometimes people hear that and they think, you know, it's, it's not a lot of money, but it's not the point. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, 
our, our children and grandchildren and descendants will continue to benefit from whatever financial uh, money is involved, but it's just the legacy that's being passed uh, through generations. So, so yeah, I grew up in seminary, uh, had a wonderful uh, childhood. Um, you know, it was a boy scout, but sports and academics, which were highly uh, uh, recommended and uh, ex experienced in our family. Uh, uh, my parents were brilliant people. Uh, our mother graduated high school. Our father did not, but we always felt that he could have been a tremendous accountant or whatever he wanted to, to be. But he ended up being a chauffeur for 63 years, most notably for John L. Lewis, the former president of the AFL CIO and, and then six subsequent presidents after him. Um, and they, they being the Lee Findle House, it's a historical uh, building hmm. where Robert E. Lee lived and where John L. Lewis lived. They yeah. now have a room honoring our, our father who, who worked there so many years. And what's, so, can you just share AF, what was that acronym again and what does it stand for? Yeah, it's United Mine Workers of America, okay. the AFL, AFL CIO. Yes, uh -huh, okay. still going on today, strong in DC. And John okay. L. Lewis was one of the great labor leaders in the history of this country. At one point, he was considered the most, the second most popular, the strongest uh, political figure uh, behind the president at wow. that time. And, in the 30s and 40s, so yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, all of us, my sisters and I, uh, were fortunate to go to one of the great high schools uh, we felt in this country, Parker Ray High School. Um, maybe four or 500 students, um, but this, the teachers and administrators were so heavily committed, invested in, in, in our development as people and, Looking back now in, in, a, in an archival way, the Alexandria African American Hall of Fame. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the first class that was inducted were 58 of us, uh, all from Parker High School, um, hmm. representing so many different disciplines. Uh, a couple of judges, my brother-in-law, who's a retired right. general and doctors and lawyers, and I was a pro coach. So yeah. Uh, yeah, but the and so Coach, Hall of Fame. You, yeah. you you brought up high school. So remember right. the Titans. So um in in my years at Fordham, when we played basketball, I love that you talked about basketball players not just being basketball players, because I think that's so true. I think athletes in general are misunderstood. Um, there's so much complexity behind everything they learn. Um and, and develop a, as athletes, but with you, and when we went to play games, I'll never forget going down the main road in Richmond, where, you know, you sh shared the statues with us and, and some of the stories and Arthur Ashe. Um, and when we played against GW, took us over so we could see the White House and, and a lot of um, these government buildings. And and get a better backdrop. But your high school is, is you know, you mentioned some of the people there. Your high school is also correlated to the movie Remember the Titans, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And we still honor it today. It's no longer a physical structure. It's on Madison Street. Uh, it tells the, uh, the story that, yes, uh, greatness did occur. Uh, at this spot. Um, real real quick uh, reference to some of the great athletic events and people that happened over the 100, 100 years of our school's existence. Uh, the on October 31st, 1950, Laura, the first African-American to play in the NBA was a graduate of Parker Gray High School. Wow. His name is Earl Lloyd. In fact, we brought him up to yeah. Fordham, and he spoke to all of the student athletes um, uh, just before he was being inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. So uh, he was a tr tremendous mentor to me personally, helped me to get my basketball scholarship to West Virginia University, and helped me get into coaching at Tennessee State University. So, you know, always coming back and being 
that uh, person that we could literally look up to and figuratively as well because he was six six, like two twenty, and he was he was one of the early enforcers, if you will, power forwards in the NBA. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, Earl Lloyd is uh, is a uh, just one of the great names in the history of our country and in the world. Uh, and then right after him, our high school boys team, we had girls high school sports, but our high school boys team, just a little ahead of me, uh, won three consecutive Virginia State basketball championships. And the last of the three uh, was an undefeated team in 1957. And they were ranked number one in the Washington Post, which includes all wow. the high schools from D.C., Maryland and Virginia. Parker Gray was number one. That's the first time that it ever happened. Uh, I mean, a great player. One of them went to the University of Connecticut, your way. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Walter Griffin, 6'5". And so and then I came along, and I guess I was, you know, the next whatever. Um, I, I wasn't on Sports Illustrated, cover of Sports Illustrated by LeBron, you know, like, mm -hmm. I wasn't a chosen one, but no. Uh, but I had a good career, uh, all state, all metropolitan, which in Washington, again, when you make the Washington Post all metropolitan team with the players coming from those three jurisdictions, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, uh, it's it's a strong team because yeah. you know, the names of Elgin Bale and Dave right. Bing and you know Kevin Durant and Adrian Danley and on and on and on uh, have mm. come through this this region. So I was really fortunate to be on the 1964 all metropolitan basketball team. And uh, and we were good. We our team we we lost in the state championship. I uh, never got that uh, championship for our coach who had won the three previous ones I was telling you about. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But we uh, we our competition was so strong because yeah. of again the, the the geographical location of the school to D.C. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting how much high school sports have changed when you think about. Um, you know, especially I grew up in Los Angeles, there's a mystique and a truism to growing up in city basketball, right? right. And the amount of competition you get in these large cities um, that you just don't get anywhere else. You have it in DC, um, Baltimore, Los Angeles, New York City, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, obviously where, where you're from, historically, especially in that time period, Los Angeles was still a baby, right? Coming up in the sports world back then, this was really the heart of, of American hoops in a lot of ways today. Now you have prep schools and they fly all over the world and they play in Vegas and tournaments. It's a totally different ball game. But back then what you're saying really was significant because you were probably, you know, one of the, the best in the country. And then from there you went on to West Virginia, Yes, but I don't want to dismiss. <laughs> You're not 75 years old with your knowledge of, <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> of basketball that you just articulated in. And it's interesting because some people say there's a West Coast bias or excuse me, an East Coast bias of because of what you said, because the game was really enhanced. Yeah. The sophistication, you know, that's why, among other things, you know, Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Went from New York City to L.A. because he Absolutely. Was Look at the UCLA certain. team. I was just with Mike Warren. He was an Indiana yeah. kid. Lou Alcindor was New York City. It really, yeah. I mean, the, a lot of the pros have retired to Los Angeles um, over the past, you know, 25 years, which I think has really made the West Coast sort of a hotbed, right, for the, right. the next generation of kids. But it really, you know, what you're talking about in this moment of basketball history in the U.S., you were at the epicenter of it. Yeah, and again, everything evolves, as we know, Laura. And yep. so uh, back to your question and point about the Remember the Titans movie, <laughs> um, you know, the Disney depiction of that, uh, the reality was that in 1971, um, this high school uh, called T.C. Williams High School, named after the segregationist who was the superintendent of Alexandria Public Schools, the name has now been changed. It mm -hmm. is now Alexandria City High School. Uh, in fact, Earl Lloyd uh, had the court, had, yeah, had the court named after him. And mm -hmm. he he understood, again, the history because he was finishing high school in 1946 at Parker Gray and, and mm -hmm. never had any interactions 
with anyone except people of, of color. So mm -hmm. all of the competition that we experienced, that I experienced was at Parker Gray was against the black high schools in Virginia, some in Maryland, mm -hmm. and then a okay. lot in Washington, DC. So yes, the competition was fierce and it really helped to prepare me for my future, which it's incidentally uh, included integration. So I mm -hmm. went to segregated schools all the way through the 11th grade and then my family moved all of five miles, <laughs> still in Alexandria, but it was a Fairfax County school in Virginia, Groveton okay. High School. And so we helped to integrate schools in Fairfax County. And so I played there uh, my senior year and quite frankly, and I'm being very humble, but I'm, I need to be accurate. The competition yeah. that I had <clears throat> at Parker Gray against Dave Bing and other great players from, from Washington, especially, um, uh, the competition at Groveton paled in comparison. It was, yeah, I and that. I was a 16 year old senior. It wasn't like, you know, but I was blessed to have good physical abilities and hopefully a, an intellect that allowed me to play a, a, a smart game. And mm. yeah, um, so I dominated. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that. So obviously there's the basketball side of things, but you mentioned integration, right? right. And being kind of at the forefront of that. Do you mind if I ask what that was like? Was it terrible? Was it hard? Was it easier? Like, was it was the world ready for it? What was that like? Well, I had this conversation for about an hour yesterday, Laura, with uh, <laughs> my, my best friend, a retired judge from Little Rock, Arkansas, who went to Horace Mann High School, all black high school in Little Rock, and, and then Yale University, and then the University of Michigan Law School. And he was the mm. first black magistrate judge in the South. He's wow. one year older than I am. So he he and I have so many similar experiences mm. from our high schools and our environments in Little Rock and, and Alexandria. And then the third person that we played golf with and, and commiserated with afterwards uh, grew up in Camden, South Carolina. And mm. so it was uh, it was an it was a good and a bad time and i really i'm an optimistic person positive person uh especially a positive person to be able to listen and learn from my parents my older sisters our teachers our coaches and realize that that uh, our self-worth was number one not uh, not wrapped up into athletics you know education was always uh, mm. the key point but we knew that we were being prepared by uh by great people who had gone through more challenging times than we did in the, yeah. in, the in the history of our country. So uh, the, the segregated aspects of Alexandria were profound. In fact, Earl Lloyd, you know, being the, the genius that he is, used to say, uh, uh, and I mentioned George Washington High School, maybe I did, but anyway, George Washington High School uh, on Mount Vernon Avenue, and then the railroad tracks in Parker Ray, literally on the other side, Earl would say, uh, if you walking down, if you were an African American walking down Mount Vernon Avenue, you better have a mop and a bucket in your hands because otherwise, you're out, you're out of your territory, if you will. You know, oh. so we not only live but we associate it because of restrictions. We couldn't right. go to certain restaurants. You know, we had right. our own um, amenities. You know, black theaters, black businesses. You know, barbershops and a whole nine yards, churches especially. Mm. Uh, so. Those three schools in Alexandria, Parker Gray, our high school, George Washington, and Hammond High School, two high schools and one black high school, formed this mega school called T.C. Williams High School. And they wow. won the state championship in football. And, 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 and our good friend, Denzel Washington, uh, yep. played uh, the role of Herman Boone, who just passed away, the great coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll never forget. I have to tell the story about it. So I'm coaching, coaching you at Fordham, and then I hired you as an assistant coach. And so uh, I'm sitting in our uh, expansive office. You remember the – Yeah. You, know, <laughs> hey, you could reach the walls on, by stretching out on, on either side. But I'm sitting next to the door, and it opens up, and you come around. And, and just as a quick aside, you were one of uh, maybe two, three, I don't know what the number was uh, – uh, white players on the team, all right? Okay. So the, your teammates actually called you sunshine yes. because you're 
from California, you were blonde, and, and to remember the time well, you had this quarterback. Yeah, and we, in. yeah, the the yeah. California quarterback, and we watched when it came out. I mean, it's just a great film anyway. But your relationship right. to it, I think we must have watched it ten times the season it came out um, Inquiry, on the yeah. road. Mandatory. It was yeah, <laughs> it was always you know every bus ride we were on, and it was funny because you know leading up to what what you were about to say I'm I'm coming back from Lombardi working on I look up and I see Denzel Washington in front of me like Denzel what are you doing at Fordham I mean obviously he's a Fordham graduate um he's like oh we're shooting Manchurian Candidate across the street just coming in to get a workout and I'm like Denzel I know this sounds crazy but you have to come meet my coach he's right around the corner and uh and shockingly he agreed to come with me and next thing we know, we're I'm in your office, and it's uh, you know, and what a what a great great person. Um, I obviously don't know him so well as an individual, but for someone of that prestige, you know, to be so open to meeting the girls' basketball team and the coaching staff at at Fordham, and just the roles he's taken on, like the T.C. Williams coach, and telling that story in such an epic way. I don't know how true, right? All of the components are. You lived it, um, but it was yeah. So that was yeah. yeah it was really cool yeah, because you know, <laughs> but it, it took a special person to get Denzel Washington <laughs> to come to come into the offices. Uh, and so the door opens and I'm sitting there just relaxing and you you come in, you say, coach, guess who I just met? And I'm looking up and the guy sticks his head through the doorway and extends his hand and says, hi, sunshine, how are you? <laughs> it was Denzel. It was, it, was, it was really a wonderful time. And I remember, yeah. I'm sure you do too. Uh, and even though he was a avid Fordham alum and sports fan of the university, he started wearing Fordham women's basketball t-shirts and sweatshirts on the sideline of, of the Lakers games. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We hooked him up. I think I slipped him a 20 to, for him to do that or something now. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So back to what you were asking again. Yeah. I graduated from the white high school in 1964 after okay. going to Parker Gray for four years. So I really feel, um, a stronger affinity, obviously, yeah, for yeah. being there for four years, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh grades, with all my family having gone there. But uh, integration for me was fairly seamless, um, mm. and uh, there were issues here and there. But so my finishing in '64. Fast forward seven more years is when they remember the Titans uh, year oh, occurred, 1971. Okay. Yeah, so. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of memories, a lot of memories. Yeah. So. so, so just not to harp on the on the story of integration, but I I remember a lot of your you know you told the best uh, stories and in I mean it's just for me it's so fascinating that the world actually lived in the place that it did. It seems so far removed from how I perceive the world, but your stories you know really brought it home. And you ended up going to West Virginia into a league that was just experiencing integration too, correct? Absolutely. Um, all right, quick story on that, because right, Earl Lloyd, again, as I mentioned, helped me to yep. get my scholarship because even though I was a good player, and I had some offers from other places locally and American University and some HBCUs and whatever, but Earl Lloyd had played at West Virginia State College, a historically black college in Institute, West mm -hmm. Virginia, 11 miles from the state capital, of Charleston, right? And this, and they were the only undefeated team in the country in the 1948-49 season. He was a two-time Black College All-American, right? So, um, the guy who led the nation in scoring during that same time frame, his name was George King, and George played at Morris Harvey College in Charleston, 11 miles from where Earl was playing in college, but they didn't know each other. They didn't play against each other and all that. Fast forward, Earl mm -hmm. became a member of mm -hmm. the Syracuse Nationals because the team that drafted him, the Washington Capitals, to break the color barrier in 1950, they folded. And then he was drafted into the military. Okay. So after coming back from the military service, he joined the Syracuse Nationals. And in 1955, Laura, mm -hmm. Earl Lloyd was teamed with 
a guy named George King. Hmm. Hmm. Great guard who now, like Earl, had retired later on in the late 50s from playing pro ball. Earl from Detroit Pistons and, yeah. and George King. Uh, and he became an assistant coach at Western University. And, uh, oh, okay. Coach, coach the great Jerry West. And when Jerry West left, his, his coach at West Virginia became the new coach of the Lakers. And so George King moved oh, up from being oh, an assistant wow. to being the new head coach at Western University. And so he called Earl and said, Earl Lord and said, Earl, I need some players up here, you know? And yeah. also, man, I got a guy, I have a guy right here in my high school. <laughs> and so he yeah. saw me play and I think I had 35 and 25 rebounds that night. I'm not bragging, but I'm just stating the facts, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I get the scholarship, and I was the first African American to sign at West Virginia University. We had a class of eight freshmen from all over, and four of us were uh, African Americans. Unfortunately, the other three have passed away now. Two of them this year, and I'm doing all I can to continue to tell the story yeah. about number one, our All American there, Ron Fritz Williams, who played in the league for nine years with the Golden State Warriors, San Francisco Warriors at that time. So, yeah, we integrated the university and the Southern Conference, uh, mm. of which uh, you knew some of the teams, you know, Richmond. I'm, I'm sure and that was, that was I'm a sure trip. The, going to Richmond. the South yeah. loved that, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, was, yeah. So here we are, the, the northernmost team in the Southern Conference yeah. in West Virginia. It was like that was a, a beacon of progress, a progressive living. <laughs> but we put, when we played at the University of Richmond, just, you know, mentioning them as one of many, uh, yeah. The the old gym in which we played, I mean, the, the the stands were right behind us. And so we heard everything, just like the uh, attorney general in, in Georgia is hearing everything right now, being mm -hmm. called every name under the sun. We heard all of that. But our discipline and our preparation was such that we knew what we had to do. And, um, you know, and then we went out and beat them by 30 points. But we needed police police escorts to get us out of the, the gymnasium into our uh, buses and back. So yeah, Richmond obviously was a former uh, uh, capital of the Confederacy, you know? And mm. so here I am from the state of Virginia, yeah. you know, and Richmond never offered me a scholarship. I was a player of the year in the state of Virginia and the University of Virginia and Richmond, all, you know, so, but it's all good because there's a, there's a, there's a, satisf a satisfaction in the struggle when you're mm -hmm. involved and we weren't, uh, so politically astute as as young guys, you know, athlete, he says, you know, you, you're kind of isolated in a bubble, if you will, of you mm -hmm. know, academics and preparation and practice and games and in your yep. team. Uh, but we certainly were not oblivious to what was going on. You know, I mean, this is the, we graduated in 1968, you know, and uh, with the assassination, yeah. uh, assassinations uh, that occurred and um, and then the revolt, if you will, uh, the 68 Olympics, you know, where, you know, Lou Alcindor and our teammate, you know, said, no, no, thank you. We don't want to go to Mexico City because of how black athletes are being treated in this country. So we've seen a lot of history. Yeah. And through the prism of sports, you can always find that connection because uh, uh, I submit that sports really has been the litmus test, if you will, and the conduit to which social change has occurred. Yep. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna. You and I need to write a book one day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it's so fascinating when you look at American history, the how sports has been such a cornerstone of that evolution. You look at women and Title IX. Yep. Is it a perfect science? Is Title IX implemented in a totally fair way from a male perspective? No. No. But it's, you know, it's an evolution of imperfection that I feel like this country has gone through and continues yes. to go yes. through. We look at Black Lives Matter um, being such a, a topic of conversation and just, you know, we look at politics today. I don't sit on the right or the left because it's politics, you know, mm -hmm. but but basketball, you step on a court and. Uh, there's a truism to being an athlete and competing doesn't matter the color of your skin. 
right? It's your preparation, it's your attitude, it's your camaraderie. Um, it's, um, and, and, you know, it's, I'll be curious to see where this next iteration of sports goes. We've, I feel like we've entered a semi-professionalism in sports, um, which, you know, I was just telling somebody the other day, I, I thought it was so fascinating tennis. I went to a tennis, a college tennis tournament. I look at the roster. It's all international kids. And I'm like, mm-hmm. why Why do we have full rosters, both men and women, of all international kids? And it's great, you know, having that uh, sports does bring in that international component. But the fact that we're giving scholarships, right, taxpayer money effectively to international kids. And I asked a coach, the two coaches on the Fordham team, one was from Australia, the other one was from Russia. And I'm like, why mm. is it all international in this sport? They said, oh, they don't teach tennis the right way in the U.S., I was like, wow, as a basketball player, you know, I grew up on the streets playing pickup in Los Angeles and you learn from your elders. And, you know, that's how, at least in my world, we we developed the the game and at the boys club. But I thought it was so interesting if you look at um, sports generally as a foundation for the evolution of this country. Um, and then that international component, the gym I grew up at in, uh, you know, one of the gyms I grew up at in Santa Monica is Memorial Park. You now have to have a, a membership and a pass to go there. Back in the day, you couldn't pay someone to go in the gym because it was so, you know, people are throwing down bones in the corner and you got the homeless people living in the bathrooms. And it's, you know, it's just been the world today. It's it's interesting to to watch it continue to evolve and and what sports and how that fabric is reflective of of the society we're now living in. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And you know, uh, two quick points. Uh, yeah. Between uh, one of my coaching jobs and an, and another, I coached for fifty years, as you know. I work for the uh, uh, organization called uh, Black Issues in Higher Education. Uh, mm-hmm providing information and access uh, for positions in higher education. And so one of my responsibilities was to call the various colleges around the country and uh, ask their coaches if they had students who met certain criteria for the Arthur Ashe Sports Scholarship. And Mm -hmm. certain GPAs, obviously, you know, success on the the various uh, fields and courts, any sport, male, female. And this was like 1998. So I'll never forget, I called uh, a lot of a lot of coaches and I called Eddie Payton, who is the older brother of the great Walter Payton, mm. the NFL frame, fame. And he was the golf coach at Jackson State University where he and his brother, uh, Walter, played. And so I coached, you know, Jimmy Lewis, Black Issues in Higher Education, calling about the Arthur S. Scholarship. Do you have any players that may qualify? He's a coach. Uh, golf's a great sport, but because of uh, lack of access and finances, whatever. Mm. I don't have any black players on my team. This is a historically black college in 1998. Mm. Now things have evolved and changed right. as we, as we well know, not only in, in sports teams and, and, and how their rosters look, as you usually say, you know, mm. from the inclusiveness of international players and all that, you have to remain relevant however you can yeah, uh, and as a coach, we well know you and I, you know, trying to find the best players we could find. We had, you know, uh, players from Sweden, you know, Laura, mm-hmm. uh, you're Laura, no, uh, Lisa, Lisa Carroll, yeah, you know, the great Lisa Carroll, yeah, from from Stockholm, Sweden. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a wonderful story to to hear and to talk to people or listen to those who experience it. The last, I don't see, I say. How many times have I mentioned Earl Lloyd already? Okay, I'm, I'm going to mention him one more time because uh, African Americans uh, were under such um, restrictions. Uh, some of the mental mental aspects that went along with that, uh, creating self doubt. I mean, you know, human beings. You know, mm. you, you can't always be beaten down. You're no good. Your self worth, whatever. Yeah. Right? My point is, so Earl. Uh, Again, a family and a community that really embraced him and lifted him up so that he felt mm-hmm. good about himself. So when he goes to his first NBA practice, right, he was the 100th player drafted in the ninth round in the NBA. Can you imagine that? Wow. Nine rounds. Now they have, I think, three or two or whatever. Okay? Yeah. So and he is reading about and hearing about uh, Bill Sharman. 
you know, from the University of Southern California. Mm. And the player from Ohio State, you know, all white players, obviously, because he's the only black player coming in. And mm. so, you know, he's, he's, you know, you have confidence, but still, you know, there's a certain unknown yeah. about this. And he had never played against any white players, right? Wow. So, so, like you said, the basketball is a great equalizer. Mm-hmm. It still is. And so after a half of practice, Lord, not even a full day, he looked around and he said, hell, you know, and yeah, these guys are pretty good, but I'm better than he is. I'm better than he is. <laughs> and, and, and he ended up starting, you know, as a rookie. So yeah. it's, it's just, it's about access. It's about, you know, knowledge. It's about inclusiveness. All the things that we're hearing more and more about today, yep. you know, it, it, it's, it's gone on through the decades. And, right. and we need to tell these stories. And again, I applaud you from do, for doing this because, you know, mine is personal, but it's not, you know, just exclusive to my high school in Alexandria or, or West Virginia, you know, because we've traveled the world in our 76. And I think you said you're 75 years old, right? You said so. Uh, uh, and we learn from other cultures. That's the thing, too. For you know, sure. Just, you know, um, anyway, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, Coach, you, you've produced some great players that have gone on to do many good things. I look at. Um, you know, some of the, my teammates, right. We have Kadi with the Olympics doing yeah. amazing work there, right. She led the Mali team. We have Mobilaji who's now yes. with the NBA. She started yes. hope for girls in Nigeria. Um, right. Caitlin Caramonte. She's now at yep. West point Jag lawyer teaching law there. We have Jade Lado, right. Yes. Um, uh, Still niece <laughs> of, of the great coach. Right, Lado, um, and she's abroad with the NBA, bringing basketball to India and cultures, and showing them that that women, girls can play basketball and being a vehicle. So, and I, everybody has is great in their own right for sure. But I think you were, um, you were the the greenhouse for a lot of us to allow us to grow and become the the people we are, but also give us the opportunity. I mean, I I didn't realize the value of my scholarship till I got a job. And then you realize, and you're like, wow, this is a lot of money they gave me to play basketball. Yes. Is it, you know, are you, are you working for that scholarship? Absolutely. Um, sure. But just having the opportunity to um, play in college, go to college, earn our degrees, um, and the opportunities you gave us are are just uh, amazing. And my and my story in in that route to the scholarship, I feel so fortunate. Um, again, I I think you know the the backdrop to all of this. But in Los Angeles, I I wanted to go to school in New York and and study journalism. Wound up in technology, but I I had looked at schools. I wanted to play D one basketball. Ironically, my high school counselor had gone to Fordham, and when I was investigating all of a sudden, like Fordham was where I wanted to go, and I picked up the phone to the the coach at the time. And he's like, yeah, I don't recruit players from the West Coast. And I was like, dang, okay, well, there goes there goes that dream. But I, I decided to apply anyways. And through happenstance and for, good fortune, um, I guess that coach was fired. You came in, admissions forwarded my application to you. Granted, I did come from kind of a famous high school team. They they did a Disney movie about our high school team and and the Burge twins who right. who went there. But um when you when you got that job and called and were like, Oh, are you gonna gonna play? And I was like, Well, if you if you let me play. And uh, and you gave me the opportunity to earn my scholarship. And um, this is actually this is I, I know I showed this to you, but this is the article that was was given to me um, that actually talks about I don't know how I think I had 17 against Stanford the night um, <laughs> I, I was officially given my scholarship. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited because so much of again who all of us are or because of the people that came before us right Absolutely. and because of the opportunities you gave us and so when i created vaulted i wanted to not just tell the story of my scholarship but it, it the story is so much more nuanced it's you it's your background um it's you know 
creating the the future that we all now have and then making sure it's shared with the future generations right um not to you know everyone likes to hate on the young people and they're so entitled and they don't know how hard the previous <laughs> generation had it but i think there is a truism to that and it's our job if we don't share those stories with That's the right. next generation then then the fault is ours for right. not passing it forward and right. so um, that's where, you know, thank you so much for for getting on. And I know you have a million stories and I loved hearing them all through through college. Um, but sharing your, you know, your story because it's my story. Um, and it's it's a story that needs to be remembered forever and ever by, you know, the the future generation. So I'm excited to to vault this episode um, and just have the opportunity to connect with someone who was such a huge cornerstone of my life. And thank you for for everything you've done, not just for me, but for everybody. I mean, how many how many daughters and sons do you have whose lives you've touched? Probably thousands and thousands. I, I can only imagine. Well, that's, that's really kind of you, Laura. You know, I love you. And so many people helped me along the way. Um, you know, you and I have this, and this is the last connectivity that I can relate to everyone. So Bucky Waters did not recruit me to West Virginia. I mentioned George King did. But George left to go to Purdue University, and Bucky Waters came in from Duke and coached us for our three varsity years at West Virginia. So fast forward, he goes back to Duke two years after we graduate and becomes a head coach at Duke. And then I had gotten into the coaching profession, again, through Earl Lloyd's help. And now Bucky Waters offers me an assistant coaching position at Duke University in 1971, right? Likewise, yeah. you just articulated, I didn't recruit you. Really? I mean, yeah, yeah. But anyway, you were interested in Fordham before I came on board, but I came in and we worked together and then I hired you as an assistant. And mm -hmm. so you never know how people will uh, impact your life, you know, both ways. I mean, wh why did I didn't I didn't hire you because, you know, I don't know why I hired you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, but it's really about relationships. It yeah. truly is. And I, and I can't uh, dismiss you just saying that, you know, you had 17 against Stanford. You did. We we, we took that trip out to L.A., uh, California, specifically for you, as we always do, mm. did to try to highlight and have the players go back to the areas from which they're, they're, they're from. And so we, we beat some team in L.A. area. I forgot who it was. We smoked them. And then we yeah. go off to play powerful Stanford, right? You know, and yeah. – um, and we, we represented ourselves. They won the game, you know, but you mm -hmm. did score 17. But, you know, the, the, the rest of that story is I think you took 45 shots to get those <laughs> Probably. <seven goals. laughs> you know I like to shoot. Yeah, let it fly, Laura. Hey, fly. You, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I've always loved about you is that you, 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 were, you had courage. You really, you know, believed in you and uh, the group around you and uh you were a leader and you still are leading and this is this is such a wonderful business slash entity slash historical marker that you're putting down that one day you know people will look at it and say yeah you know i'm inspired by what she did by what you know, he did to help people. You're helping so many others. So good luck to you in this. It's going to be great. I can't wait to see the future uh, uh, people that come through Vault. Yes. Um, Proud of you, Laura. Thank you, Coach. Well, you were you were the cornerstone to allow so many good things to happen. And um, thank you so much for, for joining. Okay. You have a great day. Say hello to your family. Okay. Bye, Coach. Bye-bye. Okay. You smiling. Why are you smiling? Football is fun. You think football is fun? Yes, no. No? Certain, uh, well, it was fun. Not anymore, though, is it? Is it? Uh, no, not by now. No, no, it's not fun anymore. No. Not even a little bit. Zero fun, sir. All right. Coach Boone's school board made the decision to put you on my staff. I did not hire you. Well, I came up here to coach you. Fly! Fly!
I didn't ask to be assigned to your staff, so I guess we're both in a situation we don't want to be in. Hey, hey, if the game won't play like that, we'll lose every game. But I can guarantee you this, Coach. I come to win. We will be perfect in every aspect of the game. Get up, boy, get up, get up, get up. We're still weak on the left side. We're not weak on the left side. It's not the problem. What is the problem? I don't need you up on my face all the time. I don't care if you like each other or not, but you will respect each other. I want you to tell me something about one of your teammates. I'm rooming with Blue, sir. He wears those leopard-spotted underwears, bikini style, sir. Okay, maybe somebody who's not your roommate. Each one of you will spend time every day with a different teammate. Huh? They're gonna make a big yes. star out Does the term cruel and unusual punishment mean anything to you? If you lose a game, they'll fire you. One game, just like that. Brother, don't you know me and your mama went out on the town last night. What did you say? <laughs> what happened to you? Man. I just gave your mama a piggyback ride, and she weighs twice as much as I do. <laughs> What's going on? We want to let you know we're going to warm up a little different tonight. We are the Titans. Mighty, mighty Titans. Listen, baby. Yeah. Woo. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low. We don't let these people know who's going to win state, right? Right. 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 Greek mythology, the Titans were greater even than the gods. We're gonna change the way we run. They ruled their universe with absolute power. We're gonna change the way we block. Well, that football field out there tonight, that's our universe. We're gonna change the way we win. We don't let anything, nothing, come between us. We are changed.